the Greater Centerville Historians, organized in the year 2000. The purpose of the organization is to preserve the history of the Township of Centerville, Cleveland and surrounding area. Gerald O'Neill, Charlie Bauer, Richard Wiegan, and myself, Kathleen Sixel, were the founding members. In 1831, the territory south of Green Bay was sold to the U.S. government by the Native Americans who had title to the land. The consideration was the promise of a reservation in another state. The Township of Centerville was established in 1850. The township had a village called Centerville. The reason for the hamlet's original name of Centerville was, in the days of the Indians, there was a trail along Lake Michigan between Manitowoc and Sheboygan. This heavenly spot was exactly at the halfway mark, so the early white man gave it the name Centerville. In 1849, the village of Centerville was surveyed and laid out in lots and blocks. The village of Centerville was renamed Heika when the postmaster general informed the village leaders that another Centerville was located in the state. When it became time for Centerville to be renamed, a judge in Manitowoc by the name of Albert Schmidt would take kids hiking. The judge said, you can't call a town hiking, so why not make it Heika? Thus the village of Centerville became Heika. In the early years, Centerville had the vision of becoming a lake port. To encourage ships to dock there, two piers were built into Lake Michigan. Many German immigrants arrived by schooners and the village began to grow. The village had a brick factory, stores, schools, a Lutheran and a Catholic church, mill, saloons, blacksmith shop, and a fire department, and a brewery. When the brewery was built, the settlement began to flourish. But when fire destroyed the brewery, the largest industry, there was no longer a need for the harbor facilities. So ended this chapter of the development of Haika. Two miles west of Haika, another settlement known as St. Wendell began to grow. It had a Catholic church, a general store with a connected dance hall, and a post office was also located in the complex, a funeral parlor, and at one time a motel. With the clearing of the forest, tilling of the land began. This prompted the exporting of lumber and grains. The farmers of Centerville looked forward to the building of a railway since they had a serious problem transporting their products. In 1873, the Milwaukee, Lakeshore, and Western Railroad was built between the settlements of Heika and St. Wendell and was named Centerville Station. In 1880, Centerville Station was renamed Cleveland after President Rover Cleveland. Cleveland, at that point in time, owes its growth to the fact that the township of Centerville was a rich farming community and farmers from miles around would bring products to be shipped by rail or ship. The village of Cleveland had several grocery stores, a furniture store, a funeral parlor, several saloons, Lutheran church, hardware stores, several gas stations, newspaper, photographer studio, several car dealerships, cheese factory, several feed mills, livestock yard and lumber yards. The biggest business was the Cleveland Co-op, which offered many types of services. With the feeling of green crops, the farmers began dairy farming. With the abundance of milk, another industry began, cheese and butter making. Local cheese factories dotted the countryside. One-room schools were usually built near the cheese factories, so children would have a ride to school when farmers brought their milk. In 1958, Heika, St. Wendell, and Cleveland incorporated into the village of Cleveland. In 1968, the Cleveland Elementary School was built. The township of Centerville has seen many farming changes, but dairy farming is still the primary vocation. Today, Cleveland is known as the seat of Lakeshore Technical College, which offers an educational alternative to four-year colleges. An ancient proverb states, 
When an old person dies, a library burns to the ground. These words were the inspiration for organizing the Greater Centerville Historians. We hope to preserve as many memories as possible. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I'm going to turn the microphone over to Kathy and we're going to do our introductions and then we have a few little, I'm going to say interesting little things we're going to cover first and then we're going to uh, continue with our, our veterans here. We got a little local history here and First, we're going to do our introductions. Good evening, everybody. It is October, oh no, it's September 14th. <laughs> I'm thinking of next month. Um, I want to welcome everybody, and we can dispense with the rules this evening. And I'm Kathy Sixel, and we're meeting this morning for, this evening, for the Greater Centerville Historians. Okay, thank you. Paul Jacoby from Cleveland. Thank you, Paul. Fred Jacoby, Manitowoc. Thank you. Alice Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Willard Mathias, Cleveland. Thank you. Alice Mathias here, Chemaki. Thank you. Dan Schmidt, Elkhart Lake. Thank you. Naomi Schmidt, Elkhart Lake. Very good, thank you. Charlie Bauer, Newton. Thank you. Well balanced, Cleveland. Thank you. Rick Byersdorf, Mimi. Very good. <coughs> Audrey Ertl, St. Nazians. Thank you, Audrey. Vernon Wardy, Sheboygan. Thank you, Vern. Selma. Selma. Selma Bogle, Cleveland. Here. Yeah, get the white one. Selma Bogle, Cleveland. Thank you, Selma. Marie Pipper, Cleveland. Thank you. Joanne Mortimer, Chilton. Thank you. Don Schneider, Lewis Corners. Okay, thank you. Jerry Leonard, Town of Sheboygan. Thank you. Melvin Neely, Cleveland. Thank you, Melvin. Jerry O'Neill, the videographer for this evening, and I maybe we have someone else that's come upon us. Okay, just one moment. I'll uh, cut right here. We have uh, two young ladies that have just joined us, so they'll uh, introduce themselves and give us more information. Go right ahead, please. Janet Miller. Loretta, Wisconsin, or hike up when I'm here. Okay, very good. Kathy Wagner from Cleveland, Wisconsin. Thank you. We got a gentleman here who just uh, arrived also, and he'd like to introduce himself. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegan, town of Centerville. Thank you very much. Okay, we have our leader here, and uh, she's going to get us started with another evening's meeting. Go right ahead, please. Good evening again, and on, this, on the screen this evening is a uh, photo of Marie Pippert. Okay. And you know, every three months or so, the little chamber letter comes out in Cleveland and they want an article. So I, just, I called Marie and asked if she would mind and give me some information on her wedding. And she was very kind to do that. So it appeared in the chamber letter okay. and it, it talks about their wedding. Only Marie misunderstood me, and the poor girl has been very upset for a whole month now. <laughs> she thought it was just going to be in the file. She didn't realize it was going to be in the chamber letter. Do you want to add anything about your wedding, Marie? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you can see it on the bottom. Would you like to read it, uh, Charlie? Charlie, can you do that? Oh, that's going to be tough. <laughs> well, read, you want to read off the screen? Uh, I guess probably. The greater, the greater. Go down further. Go down. It says in the photo. Oh, you're going to hit it with names. Okay, we've got the uh, special uh, article that was uh, provided for a certain uh, wedding uh, occasion, and this young lady will read that. Go right ahead, please. In the photo, who can this beautiful blushing bride be? It is none other than Marie Lutze Pippard. Marie Lutze and Francis Pippard were married April 19, 1941, at St. John, 
St. Peter Church Parsonage, Cleveland, Wisconsin. Hel uh, Harold and Evelyn Brown were the attendants. The reception was held at Wimbler's Hall, Cleveland. The Cleveland Nighthawks played. The food was brought in by relatives and friends. Marie and Francis had one week honeymoon at the Pippard Cottage in Phillips, Wisconsin. So thank you, Marie. Now, anybody else that would like to, or give me some photos like Willie and Alice, would you like to be in the little village paper? <laughs> Not really? Okay, well, have we ever... We've been married 60 years yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, but anybody that has articles, please, uh, please contact me and please give them to me. Okay, Charlie? One, one other little thing that happened and I wasn't aware of is the 90th birthday of Mrs. Sessler. And everybody knows where the Mimi house is. And the article says on the, on the bottom there, you can see 200 of her closest friends. So I didn't get in the photo. Rather disappointed about that. And just a little north of the Mimi house is a little village called Spring Valley. And two Sundays ago, and this, this covered bridge is added. The, the original concrete bridge was poured in 1917. But right alongside here, two Sundays ago, Bill Heckman dug up this millstone. And we are almost 100% positive that, that that millstone came from the August Colway Mill that was located on County X, just right by Russ Road and County X. The stone foundation is still there. And the cover bridge down in Spring Valley and this millstone is related to the, the Andrew Seiple. They had the sawmill down there and the cider press and that. And it, we did find some literature on it that they actually bought the old stones from the Colway Mill and he was going to add a, a feet mill down there alongside his sawmill. So we believe that this is one of them stones down there. I thought it was kind of interesting, a little local history. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Kathy Sixel, is that that mill that was located on that Langen, uh, Langenhan farm? Yes. Langen, yep. Langenhan? Yep. 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 Okay. Yep. All right, uh, but it must have been near Silver Lake. Anybody ever hear of Schnucksville? Uh, Fred? Just, uh, Jerry? Okay, we have a gentleman who raised his hand, and he might have some information in regard to Schnupsville. I'm Fred Jacoby, and that's right, I might have. But for years, I've heard of Schnupsville as Johnsonville. Oh. Ah. And I believe that's correct, but I am open to correction. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. Okay, we have a gentleman who raised his hand, something pertaining to the Schnupsville uh, name. This is Don Schneider. We never knew of Johnsonville, but we always knew of Schnupsville when we were growing up. A lot okay. of dances and a lot of drinking. Okay, okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, we got another gentleman who raised his hand in regard to this village of Schnupsville. Go right ahead, please. Jerry Leonard. Well, the story I was always told was when they were, they were building a bridge or some structure in Johnsonville, and the weather was very hot. Yeah. So they, I wish they did at that time. I knew of that too, that I saw it done on the farm. They would mix some whiskey within the water so that the water would quench a little better. Just a little bit, I mean, it was not an overly amount. Yeah. And so every afternoon, instead of saying they wanted water, they would say, isn't it time for schnapps? <laughs> That's the way I heard That's the story. Heard the story. Okay. And it probably makes as much logic as any other one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Okay, we got to have a young lady here who wants to identify herself and give us some information. Go right ahead, please. Selma Vogel. Way up to your mouth. Uh, when my husband uh, was in the service, my husband was in the service during the Japanese War, and uh, he was on his way over to Japan when the treaty was signed. And he was uh, accompanied with uh, a group of uh, business uh, people that had to uh, take care of the uh, ending of the war. And uh, one of his friends from uh, over there had uh, given him 
this gift <laughs> that so as a remembrance from him. Okay. And it is Horiaki, uh, a kind of material, and it's very, very old. And uh, this describes what the lease was made of. Okay, okay, thank you. Go ahead, please. This is uh, the certificate which came with the vase. It's known as Kori Aki. And this vessel was discovered from the grave near Shinam, Ewa, Korea in May of 1890. Mr. Ho Ming Wan had it in his possession approximately 50 years. He uncovered a grave and found it buried many years ago. The country's people told me that this grave was hundreds of years old. My ancestors have told me that Koriyaki was made 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. Therefore, it is my country's people and my own conviction that 1,000 to 1,500 years ago the art of making it, give it, I give it to Sergeant Howard Bogle for some personal things he gave me in remembrance of our mutual friendship. Signed in whatever language, Re Che E Man, A E W O L R I. Korea, and stamped by uh, whatever. <laughs> well, very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, we have a uh, special picture on our screen this evening. And uh, this young lady will identify herself and tell us what we're looking at. Go right ahead, please. Janet Miller. I only know what's written on the back, which says military encampment at Hika Bay South Side. And it's from 1899. Okay, very good. Any, anything else you have there to Yes. Draw? Okay. It's that one is a postcard, and on the back it says, Dear Friends, Irvin and Clara, which would be my grandparents, I received the package from you today and wish to thank you for it. I surely appreciate the dainties. We will leave the U.S. soon. In fact, the day is already set. We'll write to you some of these days of my work in the Army, providing our mail will not be censored. This is a picture of our concert band. As a military band, we number 72 and will perhaps be increased to about 100 members when we get abroad. <coughs> Wishing you Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. I remain your friend, F. Cohen. And do you have a date Anybody, on Anybody, um, no, Christmas, but no, I have no idea. Okay. And I have no idea who Frank Cohn is. Hopefully somebody else does, because on this other picture, in my grandma's writing, it says Frank Cohn on the back. No, it just says, in my grandma's writing, Frank Cohn. Any comments, anybody? Any ideas? <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're looking at a special letter, and this uh, young lady here will fill us in as to what it is is involving that and give her identification first. Go right ahead, please. I'm Naomi Schmidt, and this letter was sent to my brother. My brother, Myron Zill, graduated from high school in June of 1945, and then he went into service in October of 45. Okay. But w during that summer, he worked at the Cleveland Canning Company, and they at that time had German prisoners of war employed there. Okay. 
and my brother being able to speak German befriended one of the prisoners. And this prison, I got a letter that the prisoner wrote to my brother. If there were more letters, I have no idea, but this is the only one I ha we have. Okay, good. And uh, this one, and I got to translate it. Now, this was in 45 when my brother met him, mm -hmm. but this is stated 27th of April, 1947. Okay. It says, my dear family Zill, today, one year ago, we were on a trip in hope to be home. He, uh, our living quarters are not ready at the present. We are prisoners in England, and we have to work in fields. A long time ago, I wrote to you, it was good with me, but we still think of the time we were by you. Like we never will have such a good time again as we had with you. My friend August is at home. They had to suffer real bad. His whole territory was robbed by the Russians and burned down. The Russians raped my wife. She had to be in the hospital for 33 quarters of a year. I lost my home. My wife and two daughters live with my mother-in-law in Leipzig. Leipzig. And they forced, they forced a starvation life. I myself will have to stay one more year. A person could only feel my inner feelings. For our daily income, we earn enough to buy 10 cigarettes for a day's work. How nice it was by you. How glad I would be if my family were there, but my hands are tied. I would be happy if you would write me. Are you all healthy? We hope of an early report from you. From you. We, you are all deep in our hearts. You I never forget to eternity. Your eternal, thankful friend, Kurt Cower, very stay nice and healthy. So he was a prisoner from 45 years. He was here in the United States, and he would, and this was in 47, and it would be another year before he get back to Germany. Oh. Now, what was his name? One more time, please. Kurt Cower, K A U E R. Okay. All right. Very, very. And he ended up his family ended up in Eastern Germany. Yeah. Man, so. very, very touching letter. Yep. Very, I thought it was very interesting. Very good. Thank but you. But like I say, I don't know if there are more letters or if my brother wrote to him. I don't know because my brother died in 77. Okay. So I have no idea. Okay. Well, thank you for bringing that. That was a treasure. Thank you. On the back, is the camp number is on there? Oh, they actually identified that then. And then in the front it said, written in Germany. Yeah. Written in German, I should say. Okay. Okay. Oh, we have a young lady who raised her hand, please. Go right ahead. I'm Kathy Sixel, and where did these prisoners stay? Was it in Plymouth, or where were they housed? Plymouth, right? Yes. Okay. okay Bill. Schneider. Thank you, Don. I worked with the German prisoners in a canning company in New Holstein, and they were housed at uh, Plymouth Fairgrounds. And uh, I remember one time, um, they brought him up on a bus, and two of them missed the bus for some reason or other. And a man by the name of Carl Burkholz from Elkhart Lake brought him up, and they thought they were going to be shot. And Mr. Bur oh, Mr. Burkholz gave them prisoners some cookies, and they were, I don't know how many letters they wrote back when they got to Germany to thank him for the cookies that his wife had made. But those German prisoners were... Uh, were good workers, and uh, they didn't want the war any more than we did. And I was very fortunate I could talk to them. Okay. I got fired a couple of times because I wasn't so allowed to talk German to the prisoners, but we did it anyway, but they always hired us back. Thank you. Really? Thank you. Okay, we got a gentleman who raised his hand. He would identify himself, please. Uh, Fred Jacoby. I can, I, we just had a little experience with that because um, we had the farm just three miles north of Cleveland, and each year we raised, oh, between four and a half, five and a half acres of green peas. And uh, I remember during the pea harvest, um, the 
as I as I understood it, uh, the um, Kenny Company drove to Plymouth in the morning with um, a stake truck and uh, then brought the load of prisoners to the Cleveland Canning Factory mm -hmm. and from there the individual farmers that were harvesting um, I I don't know for sure if it was just green peas or if they could get them for other work too that that I don't know but at least we had them for the peas and they could take home and we had like three or four helping us uh, because we had there were three farms there was the Jaegers and Herbert Schutte and our farm we worked together and so they were there for that duration except in the evening you know they went back okay. uh, but uh, they I don't know maybe I, I'm not sure of our perspective because you know we thought we were treating them well and I believe they were treated well and um, uh, because they liked the food uh, and you know how they the farmers ate in those harvesting days <laughs> And um, you, I think there was a rule about not visiting. I don't, I was just a kid, you know, but I thought there was, but they visited some. Okay. Uh, some of those prisoners communicated later with some of the farmers. Uh, oh, also, and uh, there was always some beer and once a day or, or there might be a, uh, a shot of whiskey offered and, and I know they drank beer and they weren't supposed to, but there was nobody there was going to tell them, you know, tell on it. Uh, so it was an interesting situation, and uh, uh, especially, you know, after the war well, it must have been just mostly over by that time. I'm not sure. I think there's a history about it in connection with the uh, Sheboygan historical thing did something about that. It's right. Yeah, I yeah. think some of them stayed there. Yeah, too. at the Taylor House. At the Taylor the House. The Taylor House right. was made over in a rush to... Accommodate. accommodate some prisoners. Okay. So it, it was interesting as a kid, you know, I observed this all and was quite aware of what was going on. Okay. Two questions that I do have uh, from the videographer. Uh, one is, what year did this take well, place? Well, see, I'm not sure. Okay. Um, it's entirely possible that Mr. Schneider knows better when this was. I, uh, I, I don't know if it was right after the war or during yet, the end of it. So, pardon? 43. 43. Okay. He, Mr. Schneider says it was four, 1943. Okay, thank you. Very good. And you had another question? Um, the Taylor House. That was, is that right? Am I using the right word? Well, I think. Where, where is this located? At the uh, Sheboygan Historical Society. It's an old big house there. Oh. Judge Taylor used to live there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, that's where right. Taylor Drive, everything gets his name from. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know that, so. Okay, well, very good. Thank you. Group before we get into Korea, because we're trying to keep this in, in the progression of the, of the different wars that went on. And I see Willard's got his hand up, and, and Buddy's looking at something over here. But we're going to start with Willard. Okay, this is a picture of Mr. Willard uh, Matthias in his young days. When he was in the army, I believe. Off yeah. <laughs> okay, we got a gentleman here who uh, is going to help us out a little bit with information on some photos that he's brought along to our meeting. We appreciate that, and uh, we'll st we have a picture on the on the screen, and maybe this gentleman can help identify him. Go right ahead, please. This is Willard Matthias. Thank you. Uh, eighteen year old kid into the, just come home on my furlough and I, and uh, I had to my folks took this picture of me and this cap I got on I had to buy that that was army issue. So that's the way it is. Okay, very good. Handsome dude. Okay, we're gonna have a I can fix that I think. <laughs> that better? Okay, now this is over in Okinawa, and this is a Japanese uh, wing that they shot off the airplane. Oh, that was a, okay, gotcha. And, and all the ones on that side are the ones that they were in, in the, that was in the Philippines. They shot those down. And the other ones are the ones from Okinawa where they shot those down. And the ones on the bottom are all the what they got credit for 
or uh, maybe or maybe not. But you can see on top at Okinawa, there's some half ones there, and that right there. Okay. And they get credit for only half that because there are four guns in the unit, and in that unit, when uh, they fire, they all fire at one time, and then the, the shrapnel that comes off of these guns, it takes care of the whole one area. I'll show you the next picture. This is, this is the gun. This is a 90 millimeter gun. Well, maybe a lot of you heard these 90 millimeter guns go off around here because after the war they were over here in, in uh, Camp Haven. Okay. And why, I don't know, because uh, when we got done with them ready, they were obsolete because the planes were too fast. They couldn't, um, you couldn't keep up with that jet aircraft. And that gun, that bullet that there that weighs 28 pounds, and they, where I'm standing next to there, that's, they shoved that bullet in that hole, and they, the fellow that's standing there next to it, he'll turn this thing. And that'll tell when it's supposed to go off. Now, if it goes off at 2,000 feet up, the bullet will go off. There's a, another one that where we have, um, that's an, what they call uh, identification. For these uh, planes that are coming in, they, they have to know if it's a Japanese plane or if it's an American plane and what type of plane it is, a fighter plane or a bomber or whatever it was. And then there's a big um, radar, pardon me, you got the one for the radar? The big, there, that's the radar. And, and uh, that, that'll tell you when it's coming in, what's coming in, uh, about how many feet and everything. Anyway, um, this all has to work. And when they say fire, you, the guy pulls the trigger, and this uh, gun will, uh, at least 30 inches back, uh, recoil. It'll, uh, when you pull the trigger, the whole things come way back. And uh, the first time I pulled the trigger, that was in training camp. I almost, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and that was the first time. So it, uh, it, uh, it's a great experience. And uh, a person just can't get over what you all go through as a young boy. And all this stuff, well, here it's on this one yet, they still got it, sandbags around. But those guns, when, when you're over there, the gun is in the ground about four feet in the ground, and there's all sandbags around it. And then over the top of that gun, there'll be um, um, a can, uh, many blends in with the, okay. the area. So, uh, like I said, it's a very ex uh, experienced thing. So it's, this is after the war, and and uh, the, the gun is out of the hole, and uh, uh, the war was over at that time. So uh, they were taking it out, and uh, from then we were, they were going to load it up in time. And these fellows I was with are all going to go back home. And I thought, well, I'm only over there about a couple of months. Maybe I'm going to go along home with them, but uh, th I guess I was guessing wrong. So I went. Cheers. Maybe one of these guys that are down there had the camera and they took those pictures, and then uh, he'd have them developed because I never had a camera over there. And so all these pictures I got are from uh, other field guys that are with their outfit. Willard, I've got a question for you. I, with the information regarding that big gun, was that aimed out in, out to the water or to the beach, or where does it cover? It covers up, the sky. Covers the sky. Yeah, it's an anti-aircraft. Okay. okay. And it'll, it also they used it for shooting into Naha, the main city of Japan, how, mean, uh, Okinawa. How far can this thing shoot? I, I have no recollection. Okay. They just give us a bunch of figures, and I never really <laughs> took it. Okay. Now this picture on top here, this is a typhoon. That's the first one I went through. This is what's left after a typhoon. There's, everything is blown down, and 
few in our area, when we got done with the typhoon, see, these are the fellows on the bottom there where I went down there, are the fellows that are going to be just for this one gun, that operate this gun. So each gun, you have your own tent, and this okay. is what was left after, when we got done after the, the typhoon went through. This is what they built up for us. In fact, we built it ourselves, and a bunch of tarps over the top, and well, until we got another tent, that okay. which took a little while. Okay, there you go. And this is the next picture next to it is the harbor on uh, Buckner Bay, uh, where I was stationed. Uh, it's three miles wide, so I got ocean on both sides of us. We could get up and outside, look on one side, and look at the other side, there was all ocean on both sides. And the next picture is the harbor. That's where General Buckner was killed. The island is three miles wide where we were, and 66 or 68 miles long. That's it. I think I got a picture of that in there too. Now this is the island of uh, Okinawa. You can see that gap, that rounding in the middle there, right up there. That's where I was stationed, right up on top there. Okay. That's the three mile wide one. And way down here on the end is Naha. And that, that was a city of the size of Milwaukee at that time. And it was all cement buildings. And by the time we got done with those, that end of that island, there, it was like rubble. There was nothing, hardly too many places left on it. And on the other end of the island is where the heaviest fighting was. And when the war was over, then they some of these uh, Japanese generals and some of our soldiers would go out and tell them the war is over. And they were so afraid of the Americans, they jumped over the cliff and killed themselves. There weren't many that really came back because they just kept jumping over the, just killing themselves. And the top picture, that's a cemetery, and it, where all American soldiers are, both of them, are at different cemeteries over in Okinawa. It amazes me that way in the bottom, that's now, that's what's left of it, way in the bottom. Okay, and from there, uh, I had a, I was like an acting sergeant of the guard in Naha at that uh, place, and where we would go out, I had a, a truckload of uh, American soldiers, and we were guarding things in Naha. I'd go out with our truck, drop them off, and go to the main place, pick up my Jeep, and I'd go around checking all these people that were on guard duty. They were on, we were on six hours off 18. I did that for about a couple months, and then my uh, commanding officer says, we put you up for a corporal now. Oh, good, okay. And about a week or two later, he come again. He said, uh, uh, "Corporal has been canceled because you're getting transferred." So, okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, what what really gets me here? You see all these trucks up there? Those are all GI trucks, and this is after the war, and they're all standing on uh, wood platforms now uh, to jack them up a little bit. And there's acres of these trucks standing over there when uh, we were over there. And it's unreal. If a person thinks about it, the war started in 1941. This is 1945. And if you looked out over the harbor and on this land, the tanks, the, what the, this country built in those four years, it's amazing of what was all built uh, to supply this war over there and the war over in Germany. It, it, this person just don't realize how much stuff 
was built over here in such a short time. And then uh, after I got run uh, with this um, guarding deal, I got transferred to a, a, a construction company. And my job was take a truck, go over to the uh, prisoner of war camp, and pick up 35 prisoners. And drive them, pick them and put them in different um, areas where they had to work that day. Each, each area had about seven guys. Seven prisoners, they'd have to get off the truck, and, and the guy met him there, and he'd take them to a working space. So I dumped these guys all off, and the last seven I would keep. They would stay with me, and I'd have odd jobs, like we'd go to the uh, with PWs, and I'd pick up like the garbage from the army camps around our area. They'd load the stuff up, and then we'd go to the dump over here. And if you look at this picture of this side, what do those people, or what are they all wearing? American clothes are <laughs> things that we threw out. They would go, they'd, in the morning there'd be so many people, or in the afternoon even, so many people there picking through everything we threw away. And I don't have one picture I don't have here is when we threw the garbage away from our, our um, pia, not pia, our mess halls. Uh, I, I still think that hurts me to this day to see people up to their knees in our garbage going through to look for something to eat. Uh, it, it, like I said, it's, uh, when I see people throw food away, it just hurts because uh, people had to, you know, <coughs> look for food at that time. And here, here is their, like a tent city. <laughs> yeah. You can see what that was made out of. All our scrap tents that were blown down from, from our typhoon and the metal, whatever they could get together, this is what they lived in, the people. Uh, it, it just makes you sick with what a war is like when you uh, see that people, even like after the war is over. Oh, okay. Yeah, on this one over here, there's this big gun that, that was facing the ocean. And when uh, the Japanese uh, the ships were coming in, they would could fire out of there. And when, when they got done firing, they could pull that gun back in again, and you didn't see where it was coming from. But they would move this gun in and out all the time and keep shooting. And uh, this bottom picture, I, is, I was also trained on a 40 millimeter uh, gun. And this was over in the States here, yet, uh, on this one here. Put on the, on the top corner, here we go. Yeah, that's another one I was trained in. I, I like that because um, they let me drive because I was the only one that knew how to drive a truck. So I got to drive the truck and, and drive around the desert, and that's a half track, it's called. And the gun is in there, and oh, yeah. they're shooting. And I, I had a lot of fun with that thing. In, in this country now, in these circles. <laughs> now, uh, I said, we, we already had them back in 1940, early 45. We had uh, traffic, I mean, these circles. In, and and uh, so th this is what I call a circle. It's big, and you can get around, and the semis can drive around, and yeah, no yeah, problem. Right. But yeah. these ones they're building now, it's, it's unreal. Put it down. Okay, here, here's my, name my truck where I'm going to get, pick up my Japanese PWs. No hill look guy. That's my truck. When uh, when it was a nice day, then we would uh, to put the cover on. When it wasn't a uh, nice day, uh, then we had the cover. If it wasn't, then it, we we had it down. But uh, there, is there a picture made with with, uh, with uh, I hope I'm not boring you on any of this. So. Oh. oh, very interesting. You, you see these ships here? The top one is when I 
got on that ship for R and R to call it. I had to have a rest and recuperation. I went from Okinawa to the Philippines for rest and recuperation. I was in there for 14 days, and I only had a hundred dollars. And it wasn't my money either. It was some of my friends gave me some money because I only took every penny. I got fourteen dollars. That's all I kept for myself because we didn't need that money. We didn't have a nightlife or or anything over there. A pack of cigarettes cost you a nickel, and the <laughs> postage was free, so you didn't need too much money. And your clothes was free, so uh, I had a, when I went over there, I had to come back with some whiskey for the boys because. We, we were lucky to get beer by us. Anyway, we uh, I come back with some whiskey, and, and then that's how I got my hundred dollars. And uh, the last ship is the one I had when I went home. They had five thousand soldiers on that ship, <laughs> and on the way home we went hit a typhoon. And if you ever was on a ship and go through a typhoon, and anybody in the Navy probably did, I don't know, but I was one of the fortunate ones that could get up on to the upper deck part, uh, inside though, and anybody that was down in the hole, they were so sick that when we got to San Francisco, they carried them out. They couldn't uh, walk or anything because they haven't eaten for so long, and they, they were so sick from the, that the ship. You see the front end of that ship? When that went down and scooped up the water, the propeller in the back was out, and you could hear it go, drum, 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 well, boy. <laughs> and then, then when it goes up the other way, and then the back of the ship, it was just going like this all the time, sideways. You never, we never <laughs> thought we'd go to get, there's 5,000 people on that. Ship. After about two days, it calmed down, and then some guys got out of the bottom, but not, a lot of them never got out of the bottom because they, they were so sick. And the stripes on there that I was in just a little over two years, and I was overseas 18 months, and I was in the 10th Army with the artillery. The AA stands for air artillery? Okay. The AA stands for air artillery? And the aircraft, I thought. Oh, and the aircraft, okay. Yeah. And what about the big red X? The 10th Army. 10th Army. Is there anything else I want to show you? Well, show that picture of those young guys. On, on that one there, we, we built uh, the, the, the <laughs> Japanese PWs and, us, and some more guys. We built uh, what you call Typhoon Terrace. I don't know if you got the, Did you see that one? Here. Huh? No, that's been fighting on that one. It was. That was. That was going to be our, our, our nightclub over there. <laughs> With something to spring home. <laughs> <laughs> I got so many pictures here. I mean, it's just that. Uh, uh, top one over there, the red cap. Grease. John Grease. The, next to him, across. Anybody know him? Roger Yost. Roger Yost, okay. And the guy down in the middle, Francis Fox. Navy? In the middle. No, in the Navy, right? No, uh, Merchant Marines. Merchant Marines. And the guy in the end down here? Stanley Dine. Stanley Dine, yeah, Merchant Marines. And the end over here is Francis Vanlo. He was in the Navy. But uh, I said, we, we'd write to each other or wherever we were. And, I have a picture of their Eugene Deasing too, and I did have a picture of Bernie Chris, but I, I couldn't find it now. So Boy, this this is the money, our our spending money. The one up on top, the pistol wasn't, but the rest of these are from Okinawan money. So that was my spending money when I got some. The, the Japanese surrendered Okinawa to us. That was, uh, what year was it? Did it say? Second September 1945. Yeah, second September 1945. Did you read that, Charlie, or uh, 
whoever. I'll try this. It says, the undersigned Japanese commanders in conformance with the general surrendering executed by the Imperial Japanese government at, is that Okinawa? No, that's uh, Okinawa, yeah. Okinawa on 2nd September 1945, hereby formally render, unconditionally surrender of the islands in the, okay, within the following boundaries, and then they got the, the, the degrees and latitudes on here. Yeah. And it's even signed at the bottom. Still water. Still water, yeah. General well, United States Army. I have a Japanese flag that I got a hold of while I was over there. Probably see a little better now, huh? Yeah, it's been folded up for so many years in a book there. The, this is my second book that I've had it in or I, I go through it and the books are all get old and so this is kind of a new book now. And one one more thing I want to show you for two more things. When I was with the Japanese PWs, I think I'm the only one that ever brought home souvenirs from PWs. And I had three rings, but one disappeared on me. And on this ring, it says Okinawa on. And uh, they made this stuff on Sundays. On, uh, when they had time, they'd make stuff. And this came off of some um, airplane parts or something. But they made this ring. And here's another one that I've got. And uh, this is uh, like a gambling ring almost. <coughs> I was fortunate enough that uh, one, one of my Japanese PWs that I had, he was a, like a, a principal in a school in Japan. And these fellows, just like they said before, nobody, they didn't want to fight. They were just forced to fight, just like, like we had to go in the army and they had to go in the army. And when the war was over, they were just like we were. I never had any problems with the seven that stayed with me. The reason those seven stayed with me because if uh, on jobs they'd have to be digging ditches or they did help build these Quonset huts. Once in a while or I had to have these guys help building a little of a Quonset hut. But outside of that, uh, they usually stayed with me and I did a lot of driving around and they liked that. They didn't have to work all day. It was very hard. <laughs> and I got another thing here. It's also given to me by one of my prisoners that I took care of that worked for me. And this is all made out of like airplane parts. And there was there was a, a strings on here, you know, like for the sword at one time. But uh, uh, stuff is 60 years old now, so. Uh, I really perish. Could you hold that against your shirt, just vertical? Like this? Ah, that's great. <laughs> Not too low. <laughs> too low. <laughs> okay, very good. Did they have a name for that knife? That's a, a Japanese sword. Okay. And here's, if you notice, there's a name on a name on here. My one grandson, he's got his name on in case I die, it's going to be his. <laughs> that goes on to a Japanese rifle. It's a bayonet. And that, he's also got his name on there, too. I've got, I've got this all cotton that I won't pass it around because it's greasy. And uh, just that it don't rust on me. But uh, I could have had a lot of this stuff, but I didn't want to take like the rifle and some of that stuff along home. This is enough for me, I thought. But what would happen after the war, these Japanese PWs would have to bring their rifles and stuff in, and then they'd throw it on a pile. And then we could go through it and take up do what you wanted to. And, but uh, I didn't want the, uh, the rifle. But once in a while I think I should have, but that's all right. And uh, what I was really looking for was one of those emperor's swords like this, but I didn't get that. Some officers would get it. 
But when they got all done piling all this stuff, ammunition, all that, on a pile, and that was a big pile, and uh, they threw gasoline on it, and burned, burned it all, and it would get good and hot, and then they would go to work and throw it over that cliff where those Japanese PWs jumped over and uh, got rid of it. I guess that's, let's see what's happening. Why don't we give uh, Willard. Mr. John Willard a, a wonderful hand yes, here. Let's give Willard a hand here, and then I think we're going to take a five minute break. Thank you, Willard. Okay, we got a gentleman here who's uh, going to identify himself, and he's got a few things to say pertaining to, I believe, World War II. Go right ahead, please. Melvin Yeadies and these prisoners were not all German. They were here, they were some Italians. I don't know if anybody could communicate with them, but the Germans we could talk to real good, and they were also here for trudging coups. And, uh, my part in the army was artillery, and we were down in Puerto Rico, and we drove out to the firing field, and we went through mountains, and then we went through clouds, and then mountains again. And it was on the other side of the island by the salt flats. That's all I have. Okay, thank you. Okay, we got a young lady who has raised her hand, and she has something to offer. Go right ahead, please. Naomi Schmidt. Thank you. I was just going to say, I think it wouldn't be for some of the sacrifices that our men and women did in World War II, plus the people back home, our parents, they sacrificed. We'd be sitting here with the squats tattooed on one sheet and the rising sun on the others. That's right. You're absolutely right. Thank you. Okay, we've got a gentleman here who uh, is going to start a new era for us, and uh, he's going to identify himself and give us a lot of information. Go right ahead, please. Jerry Leonard. <coughs> Thank you. I joined the Marine Corps in March of 1952. I, along with three other fellows, we decided one day, three of us right from the dairy, Willard remembers that day well, <laughs> Harold Longman, Edward Wagner, and myself, and Jerome Press, we... In a matter of about 24 hours, we decided we were going to leave for the Marine Corps, and, and we did. And about two days later, we were gone. Wow. And uh, unfortunately, out of the four of us, I'm the only survivor. Okay. I'm going to stop you for a minute. What year was this, and uh, that was the March 1952. Okay, thank you. And of course, the four of us were together for basic training or boot camp. Okay. And then we all separated after that from San Diego. Uh, they all went to different things. I ended up at Camp Pendleton, yeah. trained for the infantry, and went to Korea. At that time, we called it the Big Three Boot Camp, Tent Camp in Korea. And I was over there in Korea. Left, um, I always think this is amazing. I left the United States on the 19th of November 1952 and got to Korea on the 5th of December. And then I left Korea on the 19th of November 1953 and I got home to the United States on the 5th of December. I was on the water the exact same time <laughs> that year apart. Well then we got to Korea, it was <coughs> cold, Mart, uh, December 5th very cold and allude to what Willard was saying about the children. I, this is some, many things have faded in my mind, and, but this has never faded and I've told my children that. Here we were on the train going up to our outfits and here were kids five, six, seven years old barefooted standing on the side of the road begging for things. And you know, if you don't think it doesn't hit a 18 year old country boy right between the eyes. Mm -hmm. And that I never forgot. And then later on, seeing the old men coming to the garbage dumps with their buckets and going through the garbage. I remember one time we were building a secondary line while you were in the rest area. I don't know why they used the word rest because you never rested. You were always doing something. And we had to build a secondary line. This was in uh, <coughs> January of 53, shortly after I got over there. They were sure there was going to be a big push again, and uh, we were working there, and then these people came out of, I don't know where they came from, after we were done eating, they seemed to be there. 
with their stick across their shoulder than a three to five gallon bucket on each end. So after the first day of eating, the captain said, got extra garbage cans and we put the slop in one bucket and the solid foods in another. And uh, so they didn't have to eat slop, that they could eat something a little solid too. That's one thing I really remember, you know, mm. the children and the old people. And I have not forgotten that to the day yet. Like I say, other things have kind of mm. grown out of your mind, but these are still fresh. You know, then it was in February, that's when I was wounded on a nice warm winter night about zero. So that was <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about that? That was a, another episode that uh, we were out on patrol and got hit and was called back in the Jeep. And I remember uh, the Jeep wasn't working too well, probably because of the cold weather. And I remember the corpsman screaming at the driver, he better get that damn Jeep working if he wants to be alive tomorrow yet. Or <laughs> so, words to that effect. So they propped you up in a seat or on a gurney or you know, Literally put you on the back. You know, oh, really? Yeah, on the canvas, you might say, a tarp, and okay. a shelter half, and uh, off to the first aid station. Okay. And then, of course, it was so cold, and here you got into the tent, they have to take x rays. And you remember these nice cold plates that they slide under you to x ray you? <laughs> Can you imagine how warm they are in <laughs> Korea? <laughs> in a tent on a February night, <laughs> and the corpsman kept hollering, no, you got to lay still, lay still, don't move. <laughs> well, we got it done. So, and, you know, and after two days, I went on the hospital ship, recuperated, and I was there for 73 days, and then I went back to my outfit. And okay, I'm going to ask another question, Jerry. That hospital ship, where was it located? Right off the, the shore at uh, Seoul. Oh, okay. We were right or on the shore there near. So this was a a, a naval ship. Okay. So this Navy. was available to people who yeah, were wounded. Yeah. yeah it had, uh, okay. You either recuperated from there or you were on it a few days and then they flighted you over to uh, Japan. Okay. And then from there some went home or. All right. Once they went to Japan, they generally never came back to Korea. Okay. And I, after it was well, then I went back to my outfit again, and okay. that was about the 3rd of May, and then um, a few days later I was back up on the line again, and okay. till this July 27th, 1953, then the <coughs> ceasefire came into effect, okay. and then we went up and guarded the DMZ, the demilitarized zone, and, which was very monotonous, but again, winter came, and there we were up there in October and November, Mm -hmm. Sitting out there for five hours in the cold, you had eight rounds of ammunition. Only that's eight that's rounds. All you had because we were, we were now peacekeepers. We were no longer combatants. Ah. So all you were supposed to have is enough to defend yourself, and we always had a, um, a slogan: seven rounds for the enemy and one for yourself. There you go. And I think Charlie's heard that phrase before, so he's nodding over there. <laughs> but no, because that changed. We were no sure. longer combatants, sure. so we were not supposed to be aggressive. And, okay. uh, but we never had any incidents, so I have to say. Okay. Some areas that they did, but we never did. Okay. Maybe because I was there right at the end of the ceasefire. Later on, I suppose, monotony sets in, which often happens. And it happened with us, too. You would be up on the line, and if it was monotony, Pretty soon somebody would fire off their rifle, see if they could get some return fire. Because you have to create some activity and yeah. get bored. <laughs> so then, uh, don't laugh. I, uh, so then, on, like I said, then I came back home on uh, December of 5th. I was back in the United States at San Diego, or not, at Treasure Island, at, uh, San Francisco. Okay. And then I still had, because I had enlisted for three years, I still had 15 months to do because I just had that boot camp, tent camp in Korea immediately. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I went to Quonset Hut Naval Air Station at uh, Quonset Point at Rhode Island. 
and did guard duty there, and that was good duty. If somebody could have guaranteed me that for 20 years, I would have never left. <laughs> but Willard said he went through a typhoon. I experienced two hurricanes that year. Oh, <laughs> and they, one, uh, just one thing, and then I'll stop. We had, uh, had we were guard people, and I was a corporal of the guard, and we had the Navy's big aircraft would leave from that port, and the sh sailors' cars would be parked by the hundreds, if not the thousands, on near near the water. And we had a guard van. We had a little guard shack out there. And the winds were starting to blow. And uh, the guy called me. I was sergeant of the guard, and he said, "You, I have to get out of here. My shack's going to blow away." So I told the officer today, and he said, "Well, get down there and pick him up." And this is no lie. As we were driving away, the guard shack blew away. Really. And uh, two days later, after this storm ended, there was not a car on that pier. They were all in the water. They spent days and days out there with the derrick picking these cars out of the water because they had to get them out of there because the ships had to get back in there. Yeah, yeah. So if anybody has ever experienced a hurricane, they'll know what I'm talking about. And I never thought that a wind could have such such force, but it is powerful, and I think Willard will agree on that. Then, uh, so then I finished my time out there, and I came home after three years. And well, of go. course, then I, re I received a Purple Heart while I was on the hospital okay. ship. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, and that was kind of uh, they have here comes the the Colonel. Okay. And his aide walking by with a box full of Purple Hearts and handing them out like Cracker Jack, you know. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how plentiful they were, mm -hmm. you know. Is there any formal wording or uh, announcement to you? Not really. Got a little sheet of paper and they thank you. Okay. You know, the thing that really always, I never really would get too, I say, proud of that Purple Heart because a lot of families, that's the last remembrance they have. So I think when people start, I don't know what word I should use, saying, well, I got the Purple Heart, you know, take it easy. For a lot of families, that's the last remembrance they have. Yeah. So that to me, that Purple Heart, not necessarily just for me, but for the families, is a very, very sacred thing. So okay. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Jerry. Good job. This is Don Schneider. Thank you. I would like to have uh, hand this back to Jerry and then uh, have him explain the joys of night patrol over in Korea and also the flamethrower. <laughs> okay, Jerry's got an assignment here. Go right ahead, please. Jerry Leonard, we're not going to go home at 8.30, 10, are we? Because <laughs> I could tell many stories about night patrol. The flamethrower, if any of you are aware of what the flamethrower is, it's a weapon that you ignite it, it blows a flame out of napalm oil, and uh, it was used, especially like to be used in confined areas, because if it didn't burn you to death, it sucked all the oxygen out, and you were dead from the lack of oxygen. So it really had a two-fold, fold, mm. fold uh, message or uh, meaning that they could bring out with that flamethrower. And it was right, what you're talking about, I wasn't going to talk about that, but the night patrol, we went out on a night patrol one night, and well, like always, sometimes things don't work out right. We were going to go after them, but they discovered us before we discovered them, and it was not a good night, and we got hit <coughs> pretty hard. And I remember this was one thing, probably about the third patrol I was on, and uh, one guy was wounded pretty badly, and I and another fellow had got the job uh, to be the litter carrier to carry him back. Now, I, I was a BAR man uh, with the Browning automatic rifle. The rifle, it was kind of referred to as the baby machine gun. They don't use it anymore. It weighed 20 pounds. It was not light, a 20-pound weapon. Most weapons are between 8 and 10 pounds. And then I had another 20 pounds of ammunition, of which I expended very little, so I had this literally 40 pounds on me. And I'm helping carrying this wow. litter, and we're getting fired on. I mean, I don't want to exaggerate, 
But the thing that saved us, thank goodness, it was a, a 50 caliber machine gun, a pot gun on, the sh on our side there, which actually the 50 caliber machine gun is an anti-aircraft weapon. But they used it over there for, uh, for ground forces, and so they called that in to fire, and they fired those rounds over our, right over our head. And every fifth round is a tracer, so if you can picture this red flying past you. And they were still coming at us, and the lieutenant kept screaming, everybody stay low and bring that click down another one. And today, and I swear, if anybody would put their hand above their head, they could have grabbed those bullets right out of the sky. And well, anyhow, eventually they must have got the right area, so the, it, or the fighting broke off which often did after so many minutes it was over and then we we I, well we had to keep carrying this guy back because we didn't know how bad he was and uh, well we got him back to the bottom of the hill and then we, it was a relief and after a while it was figured out that <coughs> I and that other guy carried this fellow over a quarter of a mile and never set him down once wow wow thank you Jerry thank you Okay, uh, we, would you be ready to give us a, a little bit of information, please? I'm Don Schneider. I uh, fought over in Korea. Um, I did my, it's my picture up there. Uh, I brought some pictures along, but I could talk for an hour, hour and a half on some of the experiences that we did have. That picture up there is, uh, I just got out of MASH Hospital, and my right leg is still a little puffy, but... Uh, um, there will be another picture coming up. Um, I, I, got, I got hurt before I ever really got into my unit, which was the Wolfhounds, and th they said they couldn't take me back up after the ambulance picked me up because we were ambushed. They wiped out the truck behind us, and a lot of guys I went to radio school with got wiped out. But anyway, they said, well, the ambulance got hit. And a couple of months later, I got a picture of the ambulance that had taken me to um, the MASH hospital. And this is what the ambulance looked like. The mortar round came in and took the engine right out, and another mortar round came in and took the side out. So I was pretty fortunate I wasn't in it at that time. This is, this is some of the area that we... Um, Actually, that is a bunker that we lived in, and there's some of the trenches I fought in uh, Heartbreak Ridge and uh, a lot of other areas. You name it, I guess we were there. And uh, I was joined, I was in an outfit called the Wolfhounds, which was a, a regimental combat team. And I have a lot of respect for the Marines, but I give Jerry a hard time all the time. Um, because when the Marines went past our, our unit once in a while, we would um, say, uh, we have no fear for the Marines are here. And when the Marines came past our outfit, they would holler out, we have no fear because the wolfhounds are near. And a, yeah, in order to be a wolfhound, you had to take ranger training or you really had to be up to it. We were like um, an area, um, not an area, but uh, a bunch of guys, um, equivalent to like the Green Beret. It was nothing but fight, fight, fight. And about every three weeks they tried to put us in a, what we call a reserve area, which Jerry knows. And then once in a while, because God gave me an uncanny sense of direction, I would take a Jeep once in a while and drive a captain around because he always said I never got lost. And uh, it was cold in winter, I mean mighty cold. Um, you, when, when you got hurt once in a while, you didn't even feel it. I got my finger half shot off one time, and I never even noticed it. And that's, that's how it was in winter. It was cold, we had chains on, and it was 20, 30 below. We, um, we slept outside. I slept outside on the ground for 14 months. We weren't as fortunate as the Marines to have tents once in a while. Uh, but uh, we did have a bunker. Uh, we did have a bunker where we slept in, but we still slept on the ground, and the ground gets pretty hard. And in summer, it was nothing but mud. 
And I tell you, that was mud. And that, that on that picture, I'm sitting alongside a road, and that road behind the rocks behind me is a road. Uh, it was hard on tires, and it was hard on equipment, but that's the way our roads were, and our boots were all muddy. And that's the way it was in, in summer. That's the way it looked. We had chains on our vehicles, and it was all mud, and then you lay down in the mud and tried to sleep. And then, the, and then there was, it was, it was noise. I tell you, there was noise. There was, there were more artillery rounds fired in Korea in those three years than in the Second World War in the European and Pacific theater. There was just constant, constant artillery. And I think in 14 months, there were nine days that we didn't hear artillery coming in. But there was always artillery going out. The barrels on the quad 50s or the half tracks, they, they were 450 caliber um, guns on, 50 calibers on there, and the barrels would get red hot. And the tracers at night was nothing but tracers. And there, if you can hold that picture a while, I would just want to explain something. Okay. These, these hoods, if you look on the left-hand side of the picture near that post, that is a hole, and that's where the Chinese would come in or come out of, and there's only a few men left on that patrol that were looking for uh, the Chinese. Um, they come out of these holes, and they'll fire at you, and then pop right back in again, and you never know. They're so well camouflaged, half the time you can't even find them. And in some of these holes, they're maybe only three or four feet deep, or down into the ground, and some of them might have um, like a whole room down there with side tunnels. And, after, and the only thing that you could really get them out with, mainly, was a plane tour. And if you had, uh, it was like shooting a flame into a box. If you, if it was real shallow, it would bounce back at you. And this napalm is like a jelly. You can't wipe. If you wipe it, it'll burn no matter where you where you wipe it. And uh, uh, I, it was it was dangerous work. It was all dangerous. And some of them, we uh, you could get bulldozers up there because the hills were too steep. And um, a lot of the tunnels that they did have had side tunnels on, and they were maybe, the main tunnel was maybe only three or four feet wide, and somebody had to crawl in there, and then the side tunnels were on a slope that they could roll hand grenades down. So if you could, if you had somebody going in there trying to um, uh, fish them out, they could roll the hand grenades down, and that's how I lost my, a, a good buddy of mine. He was my tunnel rat. He, um, he would go in, he was fearless. He was from, he was a streetwise kid from New York. He was, um, I think he was 16 years old, but he was good. And he rolled a hand grenade down on him, and that was the end. And our average, I think the average age of uh, most of our guys in my unit was um, I think 17 and a half. I was one of the older men. I was 20. I was a whopping 20 years old when I was over there. My communication sergeant was 17. We were all a bunch of kids. The oldest man in our outfit was the company commander, and he was 26. Um, okay. This is uh, this is what a bloody ridge. It's part of Heartbreak Ridge. And there's no vegetation on it. You couldn't get tanks up there. The hills were so dang steep. And when the when the fellows got wounded or something, uh, you, most of the time we didn't take stretchers along because the guys in the front would have to have part of the stretcher on their uh, shoulders, and the guys in the back would be dragging it on the ground. And about every ten minutes or so, you had to uh, shift people. And uh, most of the time, we didn't take stretchers because uh, that night patrol was, was hell. And there's just a couple rounds going off. I mean, I mean that shrapnel was flying. And very seldom I had a camera. But uh, once in a while, I did have the camera with me. And I just, they were really pouring the rounds in. And that's what it looks like. But the shrapnel is flying. This is one night's work. Now, uh, I don't know if you people want to see this or not. 
but this is where I get my nightmares from. These people kept coming and coming and coming, and you can ask Jerry, they came over the hills like ants out of an anthill, and they just kept coming. And there's bodies and bodies and bodies, and, and there was hell. You had to go to them and try to roll them over and see if whatever uh, you could get out of them. And a lot of them were booby trapped at night that you roll <coughs> one over. We usually tied a rope or something on them and tried to pull them over because too many guys got killed. And that's, that's another picture of this was just constant, just constant, day after day after day. They just kept coming and coming and coming. And the barrels on them, on them guns would get so hot that they had to change, on the quad 50s, they had to change barrels. And them long toms, them artillery pieces, they would just keep right on firing and firing and firing. And they still never stopped coming. This is, uh, I was about, uh, when we were in reserve area, once somebody got, took my picture and, uh, uh, we had taken a hill, and he asked me how I was, and I, I told him I was, I was still alive. And you, the only thing that happened to me on the uh, left side of my, on the left side of that picture is uh, I just had a chunk taken out of my cheek. That's I was fortunate. I was really fortunate. I only got, uh, I only got hurt three times over there, and um, I was really lucky. And um, yeah, this is one of my buddies. Um, I send a picture home, oh, who's gonna write to his mother, you know? I mean, that's, that's hard to take. I, I get nightmares from this kind of stuff. But I, I have to talk at schools and stuff, and uh, I go to a psychiatrist, he tells me I've gotta talk to, about this, because uh, otherwise it drives you crazy, and it'll get, it'll get you in the end. And that's, uh, this is a sad picture. Uh, these are some of my buddies. The Chinese overran, they were waiting to be shipped out to uh, the hospital ship and uh, they, didn't, they were wounded and they were on stretchers and the Chinese overran our area and they tied them up and shot them all. And um, this bottom picture is also a bunch of bodies, but this, this picture on top is hard for me to take because I knew some of those guys and they were all just young kids. They were stretcher after stretcher after stretcher just waiting to be shipped out and these Galdang Chinese, um, they just tied them up and shot them. A wolf. <laughs> this is when you join the wolf hounds. You're now, uh, can, you, can you skip the top there? Yeah. You're now a member of the wolf hounds. Never lost a position, never failed a mission, oldest regiment in Korea, most decorated. Are you up to the wolf hound standards? And boy, I tell you, you had to be sharp to be a wolf hound. Well, you were, they were like the Green Beret, they were, they were a bunch of fighters. <coughs> and that's Heartbreak Ridge. Um, it doesn't look like much maybe, but that's an area of about four miles up to the top. And off the fingers of that ridge is like Pork Shop Hill, um, Sniper Ridge, um, um, Bloody Ridge. Um, some other ridges, and it would take you about uh, eight hours from the bottom to get to the top. And the Chinese had it, and we, uh, it took a month long of fighting just to take this hill. And we lost 1,051 GIs killed, and over 2,000 uh, 2, wounded. And we had it for a while, and we weren't supposed to win the war, this forgotten war. So after a month, we gave it back to the Chinese because some big mucker up in Japan or someplace said that we were across the 38th parallel. Well, Sniper Ridge was and so was Pork Chop. But anyway, we gave it back to the Chinese without firing a shot. We had to move off of it. And that's why they called it Heartbreak Ridge because it was a real heartbreaker. And two months later, we had to take that sucker again and it, it was held the second time just like the first time because you remembered where this guy got killed and that guy got killed and your buddies didn't make it. It was a war we weren't supposed to win. There's, um, there's a sign that says, uh, Tweedy's portals rocked the wolf hounds, the best damn soldiers in the world, and we were proud to be in a wolf hound. There's one of the hills 
one of the ridges or hills that we did take, and I was uh, just before I went home, and I was I was lucky to be alive. Can you explain your weapon? That is an M1 rifle, and the bayonet fits on there, and that's what we use. And it was all um, weapons from the Second World War. All our equipment was from the Second World War. Everything was. Our sea rations were from 1946 and 1948, and most of the time we ate sea rations because too many of the, um, the, the cooks got killed trying to get us some hot food. And um, most of the time we were in a foxhole or a bunker, and very seldom did we ever um, eat in a mess. We never ate in a mess hall. We were on the go all the time. I have here, um, I have here a, a weapon that I can pass around. How much time do we have yet? We got about probably five, maybe ten minutes at the most. Okay. All the equipment that we captured was Russian made. And we were only allowed to do so, so many things. We weren't allowed to blow up a bridge on the other side, but we could blow up a bridge on our side. And it was, it was politics in the whole war. Um, some of the, the big wheel, the generals or whatever they were that we captured were, see in the Second World War, China was an ally to the United States. And some of the um, officers that we did capture knew General MacArthur because they went to school at West Point. And these, some of these uh, Chinese could speak English better than we could. We, they didn't say these, thems, and those like we do, you know. But they could speak uh, very good English, and they knew uh, a lot of the officers. Um, I, will, I will pass. Um, I'm going to have Jerry hold my, the mic here. I have a, I have a captured, I have a captured, uh, looks like a 45, it's similar, but it's smaller, and it holds the same rounds as um, their rifle and stuff does. It's, um, it's made in Russia, I got it off a Chinese officer, and it's cold plated, and he didn't need it anymore. It's a real gun, it killed a lot of my buddies, but it's empty. I have, um, I, I don't bring the clip along, but I show it to the kids at school, and it's got all Russian make on it. Everything that we captured was Russian. The, um, the tanks that they use are um, bazookas, are um, rocket launchers. The shells just bounced off them because they had these big T-34 tanks, and they were just really hard to um, penetrate. Um, I, I was I was pretty fortunate. Um, Jerry was talking about the Purple Heart, which is pretty important. But my our headquarters got overrun by the Chinese, so I never did get my a Purple Heart, or I never got my discharge from the army because when they sent me home, I had um, I was supposed to rotate with 36 points. I was supposed to be a civilian in March of 53. And in June of 53, I still fired my rifle yet, so. And in <coughs> July, we were going to get married. And then um, it was a slow go home to the uh, United States. And I can identify with the, with the props. We were on a marine lynx coming home where a prop would come out of the water. We hit a typhoon, and the ship would go under the waves for two waves, like, and then the front end would go up in the back and then just rock and guys were like, sicker than a dog and um, that lasted for about two days. Sorry for the interruption, sir, and uh, continue on, please. Okay, I'll make this pretty short. When I got back to the United States, we landed at Seattle and uh, they sent us to Camp Carson, Colorado, and they didn't want us to uh, say um, we were discharged you because we didn't have a piece of paper that says you were in the Army. And that's the way it stands today, and I never have discharged yet, but I was proud to serve my country. Thank you. Okay, i got to ask one final question of you. Does your group, the, the 
the hounds, if you will, do they still exist? Yes, they do. They have a reunion all the time, and the wolf hounds are still proud, proud to be wolf hounds, and they are still fight, they are fighting in uh, Iraq right now. Okay. And okay. Um, um, what else were we going to say? Quick hit, uh, uh, As far as the special training that required from your group and for the ones that are presently in action, where does that take place? That took place in Indian Town, Gap, Pennsylvania, up in the mountains. Okay. And it was good training. All right. It was, it was the best. Okay, very good. Well, I do thank you so much for sharing your, your activities in the war, and uh, it had to be tough on everybody, and we thank you for sharing that. And the uh, gentleman here, uh, Jerry, you got something to say? Jerry Leonard, <coughs> I just want to add to what he was saying about all the artillery fire and all the noise. Well, the day when the ceasefire went in effect, we were told at 10 o'clock in the morning that at 10 o'clock at night, the ceasefire will go into effect. Well, all day long, you would have never known it with all the firing going on. And we were so sure that would never happen, but 10 o'clock came that night and it got quiet. Oh. And if you have ever heard quiet, you, we could not imagine it. We kept waiting for that first round to go off. It was so quiet and uh, I never knew quiet could be so noisy. <laughs> true, true. You got something to add, sir? This is Don Schneider. I just would like to add, uh, um, I was really fortunate. I didn't consider myself a hero. I considered myself a survivor. I had a 12-man squad when we started out, and two of us came home. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And then we're going to continue, I think, with some of the more veteran stories here. But we're going to have John do his little thing here because we're running out of time. OK, okay we got a gentleman here who has something uh, to say about maybe a future meeting, I believe. Go right ahead, please. John Wiegand, uh, before I get into that, I just wanted to say that it always puzzled me listening to Don and Jerry. For so many years, they referred to Korea as the Korean conflict. They don't even want to call it a war, and I, I never understood that. It looked like a war to me. Everything I ever read about it, it sounded like a war. I, I couldn't get that. Uh, the other thing I was wondering about, you, uh, Don, you mentioned General MacArthur, I was going to ask, how did you feel about Truman's firing of MacArthur? And, and the reason I bring that up, I mean, I, I tried to, you know, I've read both sides. <clears throat> we have so much trouble with North Korea today. I just wonder <clears throat> if we handle that right. I don't know if Don has an opinion on that. No. Okay, there's a question on the floor pertaining to a past decision by a president, go right ahead, please. Uh, this is Don Schneider speaking. Uh, when uh, uh, Truman fired General MacArthur, it broke the morale of the troops when we were there. And um, we would have followed MacArthur to hell and well, you name it, boy. MacArthur, in our, in our book, was a real general. Uh, we really liked him. And, uh, uh, this was not actually a war, it was a police action. So a lot of things never got um, taken care of. Okay. It was a, a, what do you call it, Korean conflict, but it was just a police action. It was never declared a war. Really? Okay, thank you. Okay, I have a gentleman here who would like to identify himself and indicate uh, something that's coming up in the near future. Go right ahead, please. Uh, John Wiegand, <clears throat> I know we <clears throat> have to get back to this subject again because we didn't get to Charlie's war yet, Charlie Bauer's war. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think maybe we, <clears throat> we can continue this in, I don't know, perhaps November that coincide with Veterans Day and everything. Next month, it <clears throat> I just had a chance to contact a a lady who uh, is a reenactor. She portrays Mary Todd Lincoln's sister, and she's very good at this. She it, she doesn't talk, or is not going to get into the you know, <clears throat> Gettysburg and all that. This is going to be more about Lincoln's personal life, and she does it 
as Mary Todd Lincoln's sister, who happened to be Elizabeth Todd Edwards. So we're going to hear it from the second person. Uh, Denise Blaze is the name of the lady who's going to do this for us. She lives in Oshkosh. Her <clears throat> occupation is dental hygienist, but she does that to pay her bills. I think she likes this better. Uh, <clears throat> she's going to come here on October 12th. We'll speak for probably an hour and you know, and we'll take questions for however long it takes. If any of you have anything on the Civil War, on, you know, from your families or anything, certainly bring that along, or, you know, history or whatever. If you have any friends that are <coughs> Civil War buffs, invite them to come. Uh, if you have any Civil War clothes in your attic, or any of you have uniforms from family members, feel free to wear them next month. This is going to be Civil War month. We're going back instead of forward. So again, October 12th, our next meeting, we're getting back into the Civil War. It, it, it won't be much about battles, so those of you who don't like hearing about that, it's, it's not going to be that. It's going to be personal lives of the Lincolns. So hopefully that will turn out fairly well. <coughs> and I hope, hope all of you can come. Thank you. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, yeah. a gentleman here raised his hand. Go right ahead, please. Yeah, Paul Jacoby, I was... In service in '62, well, I didn't get very far, I guess. But I was still they were still firing the ammunition that you had left from Korea, yeah, too. All our ammunition from World War II. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. Kathy Sixel, and I hope you all enjoy this song. And also, I want to thank you guys. I mean, it's just wonderful listening to this story. I mean, not wonderful. But it's wonderful that you're sharing it with us because you we really as women don't know what war was but i am certainly learning a lot and thank you donald jerry melvin willard naomi and whoever contributed to it tonight janice janet selma thank you so much and thank you all for saving our great country our next meeting, October 12th. See you all there. Right ahead, right? Janet Miller. Thank you. Kathy Wagner. Thank you. Paul Jacoby. Thank you. Fred Jacoby. Thank you. Alice Mathias. Thank you. Warren Mathias. Thank you. Elsworth Theater. Thank you. Dan Schmidt. Thank you. Naomi Schmidt. Thank you. Go right ahead, sir. John Wiegand. Thank you. Will Bamlitz. Thank you. Audrey Erdl. Thank you. Marina Murray Key. Thank you. Selma Mogul. Thank you, Selma. Marie Pippert. Thank you, Marie. Joanne Morgeman. Thank you. Don Schneider. Thank you. Jerry Leonard. Thank you. Melvin Reeves. Thank you very much, Melvin. And Jerry O'Neill, the videographer for the evening, also want to convey my thank yous to all these uh, fine gentlemen who were so brave for us, and we appreciate it. Thank you. One more time, a round of applause. <laughs>